get Acts 18. Um, yeah, Acts 18 and um, let's start at the first verse. Let's, let's read a little bit, okay? Let's read a little bit. Acts 18 and 1, all right? Please, you don't have to stand. Who, who, who can read that for me? Uh, whoever. Get a mic, son. You, you over there. We need some more readers while they're working. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Acts 18 and 1. Mm -hmm. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born of Pontus, lately, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy were from, come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. Somebody say, I got much people in this city. I, have much people in this city. I, I, I need to stop right there. So, because I'm going to preach this again probably Thursday and teach this Thursday. But I need you to look at someone next to you and I need you to say, keep on going. Keep on going. No, that's too weak. Come on. Come on. First of all, look them. Look them in the face. Y'all, y'all, we are brothers and sisters. Look at someone and tell them, keep on going. Keep on going. <sighs> Don't stop. Keep on going sound like my brother now. Brothers and sisters, um, I'll give you the, this little piece to help you, okay? Most of us in church deal with frustration and depression. You can say amen. amen. Those who shout it, say amen. amen. You deal with frustration, frustration and depression, Okay? You've, you've got frustration. Some of y'all can't praise God right because your legs are too heavy. Not because you're overweight. has nothing to do with that. You can't praise God because there's something in, in you that's sitting in you. You're frustrated and you're depressed. Depressed people can't dance. Frust, frustrated people won't dance. Okay? But there's a difference between frustration and depression frustration occurs when people cannot achieve their goals listen it is characterized by disappointment anger and unhappiness but depression a psychological state characterized by disinterest in activities feelings of helplessness and tiredness it requires treatment and therapy and sometimes medication. Now, that's the clinical. Everybody understand? All right. Some of y'all think you're clinically depressed. No. Some of you might be. I don't know. Okay. But if you step into my office, we're going to help you. All right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so you need to understand the difference First, I need you to know which one you are. And you may be both. But then after knowing that, you need to admit it. Oh, don't be quiet. I'm not going to preach the whole thing now, but don't be quiet. Examples of depression 
in the Bible. We have depressed people in the Bible. David was depressed, troubled, and battled deep despair. Elijah was discouraged, weary, and afraid. Jonah was angry and wanted to run away. Find yourself in one of these. Job suffered through great loss, devastation, and physical illness. Moses grieved over the sin of his people. Jeremiah wrestled with great loneliness, feelings of defeat and insecurity. John the Baptist experienced mental distress after imprisonment. Adam and Eve likely experienced depression after sinning against God. Okay, but the big one is your Lord and Savior. Jesus was in the garden and so pressed that he started to sweat like great drops of blood. That's the word, y'all. Right? Don't you understand that in this walk with God, depression and frustration <laughs> is an assignment? <laughs> I need you to hear me. That if, if frustration and depression are not assigned to you, then you cannot administer deliverance. Because you yourself must experience deliverance in order to administer it. We got people in the pulpit who have not experienced nothing. And they're, they're preaching and teaching you and giving you an empty gift. They lay their hands on you and tell you to be free. But they can't free you from nothing because there's nothing in them. Because they experience nothing. I can't get a witness in here. And I'm tired of empty gifts and empty promises. It's nothing worse than a kid waiting for Christmas and the parent promise him a bike. And they wake up in the morning to look for a bike and they find a box. And the parent says, well, I couldn't get you a bike, but. But you promised me something. All right, let me go further on this. There are two prevalent theories. Okay. Um, let me deal with this part and then I'll, I'll move forward. Uh, continuity. Somebody say continuity. continuity. Or another way to put it, let's say continuation. continuation. All right. Continuity, continuation. Continuity. Uh, things coming together. Things blending together. Things working together together uh, but continuation things continuing together moving forward right when we say continue in the faith or contend for the faith that is not that is a not that's not a motion of being still that's a motion of going forward most of people when they get depressed and they get frustrated they stay still and then they use the scripture wrong I'm just standing still to see the salvation of God no, that's out of context. Okay? Because you could stand still and move. In the kingdom, standing still is not standing still. It's also movement. The, ki the kingdom is a flow. I won't go through the whole thing, but the kingdom is like water. It's a flow. And, and even when it says, uh, 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 even when it, when, when, it says, when it says that he leads me beside still water, still water is not dead water. It's still moving. Because still, if, if the water is not moving at all, it's contaminated. Y'all understand that, right? Now go into that part. So we need something that deals with this. Now, listen to this. Uh, continuity in psychology refers to the ability to continue. Uh, continue the same way indefinitely. Continue the same way. Can you continue the same way indefinitely? Continuous development is a principle suggesting that the process of growth and development are not abrupt changes, but rather gradual, uh, gradual transitions. Psychological con continuity consists of holding a number of psychological relations between persons, stages such as relations that, that hold when beliefs and desires produce uh, thorough reasoning, new beliefs, desires, and intentions or decisions. Now, I need you to listen to this part, right? Continuity versus discontinuity, all right? Discontinuity, I, I hope I'm not boring you, but continuity and discontinuity. Uh, discontinuity 
Continuity deals with the fact, I want you to look at a man going up a mountain, climbing a mountain, right? When a man goes up a mountain, he's climbing, right? He's continually climbing and making his way. But this, that's continuous. But this continuity is not a man stopping, but it's a man, instead of going up a mountain, it's a man taking steps. There's a difference. So just imagine, just imagine this. Let's do it this way. Con continuous or continuity will have you in an elevator going to the third floor. Discontinuity will have you taking the steps going to the third floor. Do you understand? Because when you take the steps to go up, you can stop at two and take a break. But taking the elevator, you can't take a break. Because if you take a break, that means you're stuck. Which way is God taking you up? Through steps or through elevator? Some of you are not designed to take steps. The reason why you're not designed to take steps is because if you stop at the second floor, you're never going to the third. You'll make a house on the second floor. You'll stay there. You'll camp there. You'll get a refrigerator and you'll go no higher. So you must take the elevator to the third floor. And then there's no other buttons but the third. Did y'all get that what I'm saying? I need some of y'all to see why you're not moving. You're not moving because you're stuck on a floor. You have the ability to go up, but you won't. You stopped. That's why I need to preach to you, keep on going. Anybody understand? In the spirit realm, you stopped because you're unhappy with life. When I don't care how powerful you are, I don't care how anointed you are. After we come out of all this shaking, after we come out of all this uh, blah, 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 and running around, you got to continue in something. And most of us continue, we continue in dysfunction. Oh, yeah, I don't care what you say. We go back to our functional dysfunctions. Because our dysfunctions function perfectly. Ah, and then you go back to what feeds you. So instead of feeding on what happened and the power of God that was in the room, you go back to your phone and look up your dysfunction because it feeds you and makes you feel. Because when, when God starts to talk to you and deal with you, he, he leaves you alone first. And that's the point where most of us get lost in the sauce. Because before he comes, he leaves you alone. So what do you do in between that period when the glory shows up? Look at Jesus in the garden. He's praying for his assignment. Being connected to his father. He never had to pray this way. Never. I need some of y'all to understand. You're at the point in life where you never had to pray this way. Father, if it be thy will, remove this cup. When do you ever see him praying like this? Because this is the clash of the titans. The clash of the titans is when your flesh gets just as strong as your spirit. And it rises up not to sin, but rises up not to do the will. Good God from Zion. It raises up because it wants its own way. It knows when it's coming to its end. It, the flesh knows when it's got to make a choice. Whether I'm going to jump in the water all the way, or I'm going to stay on the sidelines, getting my feet wet, but not really serving God. Oh, some of you, oh, I'm serving God. I live holy. I don't have sex. I don't drink. I don't smoke. You haven't jumped all the way in. That's not it. Because if you're not in the unknown, you're not in him. If you can call your shot for your prophetic life, because every one of us has it. I can prove more. Well, I won't even give that to him. If you know which way you're going every day, you are your own master. You're your own master. Who, who are you serving? Um, if you read the life of Paul, Paul now, 
All right, let me put it in perspective because it's almost three. Paul now, listen to this, and I'll, I'll be done. Paul is, is he's, he's shaking off his jacket. I'll start right here. He's been arguing with his own people, and he's trying to persuade them about, about Jesus, and they are battling him. He's, it's like a stalemate. You will never, it, the prop, turn that off for me because it's making noise, too much noise. It, the problem is when you have to battle your own people who know your method of preaching, who know your method of delivery. Okay. When your own people, you sinned with them. See, they knew Paul when he was on their side. Yeah, okay. Oh, you're delivered now, but you wasn't three weeks ago. Man, stop it, y'all. You're, you're delivered now, but you wasn't a month ago. You were the one texting me. Hey, what's up? But now you had an experience with Jesus. And now, see, the experience with Jesus, how we know it's real? Because he makes you preach right away. There's no one in the Bible that got delivered by Jesus and stayed quiet. That's how I know some people ain't really delivered. You ain't been touched by Jesus. Because everyone, he told them to be quiet. This is the only time where you'll see people not listen to the Lord and still be right. Oh, man. <laughs> he told them, keep this quiet. And they went and ran and told it. And they never got judged for it because his goodness was too good. Man, I, I, yeah, I got to tell what he did. If you're really changed, you got to tell. It's not a secret if he changed your lifestyle. Who cares what you did? Who cares if you was a murderer? He used one. Man, who cares if you was an adulterer? He used one. He used a fornicator. He used a liar. Why are you not telling what you got delivered from? Maybe perhaps you're not delivered. Oh, we don't. I don't understand how the saints get saved from sin, but don't tell the sin they got delivered from. That don't make sense to me. When the Bible says we overcome by the words of our testimony. It ain't God is good. We know that. The sinner knows that. What did he do for you? What did he pull you out of? No, he pulled me out the miry clay and set my feet on a rock to stay. No, darling. No, no. no you wasn't sinning with clay. <laughs> I was in my every clay pastor. No, you wasn't. His name was Clay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let me go back. So Paul, Paul now is on his second missionary journey, and he establishes a great work. Now he's sent to the hardest place. Now. <sighs> Just for you, Manny, and, and, and Yanel, because y'all y'all like the word. Y'all really love the word. Paul now, after he leaves, he shakes his jacket off, and he goes, your blood is on your hand. I did, I've delivered my soul. All right? I've given all that I can give to you. He did no miracles there. It wasn't about the miracle side of Paul. It was the debating side. He, he, he has to give, because they don't want a miracle. They want an argument. And any time, this is for you, sis, any time you go to a place that wants to argue about the gift on you, that has second guesses about the gift in your life, take your coat off. Shake it off and go. Because God needs you to be a witness to him. A witness is in a witness stand. Man. You're not, you're, not, you, you're, not, you're not understanding what I'm saying out of my mouth. You need to be a witness to him. You're not him. You're a witness to him. And you need to make a decision as a witness whether this is going to work if anybody's hearing me and if they're not hearing me, let me do the word. I, now you got to exhaust yourself. Paul now shows that he has exhausted himself. He's a man of great patience. So when he exhausts himself, now God sends him to Corinth. Let me hear it. God sends him to Corinth. That, but this is crazy that I was reading this. 
Corinth is a place of extravagance. They don't need the word. They don't want the word. And when you look up what Corinth was, it says they were very, the men were effeminate, meaning they did not work hard. They paid for everything. They were into art. They were into, they were into lasciviousness. They were, they were, they were, uh, whatever they indulged in, they indulged in. If they had parties, it was for days. If they drank, they drank for days. If they had sex, they had sex with everyone. Nothing was off limits because they had the money and the resource to do it. So I'm saying, Lord, why would you send him here? Why would you send? And I couldn't find it nowhere. So as I was researching last night, it said Corinth was known for something. Uh, when the Romans took over Corinth about 156 years before Jesus Christ, there was a war that went on. Right? And the Romans came in and they fought. And in this fight, there was an, there was a, they, they lit Corinth on fire. And in lighting it on fire, there were some metals that fused together that made something called Corinthian brass. Corinthian brass became, they became well known for this, this metal. And this metal, they sold, it was worth a lot of money. So they became rich off a mistake. Man, Jesus. They became very, very wealthy off a mistake. And so the fight caused the fire, and the fire caused a mistake, but a, a, a melding in a, in a melting pot where metals joined together to make Corinthian brass. It made brass, which they call it bronze. Bronze metal. Do you understand? So now Paul, now God in his infinite wisdom sends a man to Corinth to battle, to battle people who got the money, got the influence, got everything but Jesus. And the word of God comes to Paul and he says, go down there, Paul. Because after this fight, no one, no one really heard you. But in Corinth, in this in the cesspool of sin, I got a people. Now, this is what baffled me. I'll do all the rest of my notes on Thursday. This is what baffled me, that God would have, he would tell his servant he got a people in Corinth, but he's got to go down and save them first. So who are the people, Kenny? Who does God have? That means he's got sinners waiting for a word. But if Paul does not take courage, if he lets his last battle be his last battle, man, man, if he lets the last thing discourage him, he'll never go to Corinth. to exp For God says, Paul, you will not be touched here. They won't harm you because your life has been in jeopardy. The whole time. But when you get to Corinth, a place where they should kill you, they'll hear you. What are you saying, Pastor? If you do not keep on going, the next place he assigns you, you'll quit based on what happened to you in the last church. You'll never be trained right. You'll never get it right. Because you're thinking your last experience was going to be the next experience. You'll never give people all of you. You'll give people some of you based on the some of you. And the some of you right now is a hurt you, a depressed you, a frustrated you. you people don't want to hear me. I don't really have nothing to say. I don't know my gifting. I don't know if I want to be here. I don't know if I made the right choice. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And while you don't know, they know. They know what they need to hear. They know what they need to feel. Yes, they are overindulgent. God has called us to the overindulging people. Man, Jesus help me. He called us to the people that enjoy their lust that enjoy their life. We're not pulling them because they're just in despair. 
We're pulling them because Jesus is the answer. I don't think you got it enough that you really want. We can't come in here, preach to you, hum in tune, and then leave the world vacant of the Pauls. We can't come in here and not assign you to a sin. Oh, y'all didn't hear me. If I don't assign you to a sin, because you're a specialist at something, if I don't assign you to it, it will never get delivered. For I did not do that in my life. So I don't know how it feels. And I don't know the chains of a certain sin. And you do. So instead of, un- see, God help me. When God delivers you, he doesn't always pull you out of the chain. But he drops a key in front of you. He says, you choose to use this key to get free. Or you use this key and look at it. And most of you want your preacher to put the key in the lock. And if he puts the key in the lock, he's going to always free you. He's bound to, he has to do it. But if you do it, you're free forever. The key is in front of you. Now, when you untie yourself, when you unlock yourself, he gives you the power for the sin that you were committing. Even if the sin is still in you. He gives you the power to help. But if you don't speak on it, see, your key is talking about it. They don't teach that, but they do teach it in therapy. You pay someone to tell them about what you did. And God is trying to get you to do the same thing to help others. To unlock thousands of people while you unlocking yourself. But you decided, I don't want nobody to know my business. The biggest deception in the church is keeping your business to yourself. Okay. See, y'all want me to do, oh, 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 oh. Mm-hmm. You are under depression. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll get to that another day. Today is get yourself up and keep on going. This is just a teaching. Just, just a teaching. Because the Lord done did what he wanted to do to y'all. You, and he has to send you to a place that's challenging to you. Because Paul has never experienced Corinth. But he's very smart. When I study Paul, and, and this is, you can take this, I don't need this. I'm done. When I study Paul, y'all think that Paul, y'all think that Paul was just, he studied under the feet of Gamaliel, and he was supposed to be next in line as a Pharisee. Paul was really studying to be a lawyer. He, he, was, he, was, he was going to be a lawyer and a, and, and a Pharisee. But while he was doing that, under Jewish under the, the Jewish tradition, each man had to take on a, a labor. And his labor was tent making. Each man had to make sure that when all else failed, he had a trade. So he meets people, Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila, now a lot of people taught that, that, that those were two women. They're not two women. It's a man named Aquila and a woman named Priscilla. They were husband and wife. And they meet fellow tent makers. He meets people just like him, making tents just like him, making the same thing, working in the same profession. You got to meet like, if you're going to go somewhere with God, you got to meet like minded people in your worldly profession first. Because God sent him to Corinth. He sent him to a place that knows how to make money. Man, I, man y'all not getting it yet. I'm a, and I'll be done. He sends him to a place that knows how to make money. Knows how to make money. They don't, because they're so extravagant and they're so lush and they're so well-versed and knowledgeable. They don't need his knowledge first. So God has to send them there as a worker because they would never have received him as just a knowledgeable person because they don't know where he came from. He's not provable yet. 
So he has to come up the ranks as a tent maker because everybody needs a tent. Everybody is not going to get you because you prophesy, because you're smart. You'll meet people in the workplace first. And if you meet them in the workplace, you'll change the whole place where you're at. From a tent maker, he starts preaching to Corinth. Lord Jesus. He, he, he's able to get people now who's also going to fund ministry. Man, yo, you, you, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying, son? God needs you to wherever you work. You're going to meet people in a place, right? You work there. They live there. But you don't know what they do. And, and the very God that's in you right now will lead you to people who need you. And will sow into you. Because sowing means nothing to a person who just got free. It means absolutely nothing. Most of us get it twisted. We want God to send a basketball player in here with a lot of money. We want God to send a football player. We need, oh, what if Denzel came into this service? What if he came? What if he did come? So what? What does that mean? Stop thinking that way. Change your ministry mind. You understand what I'm saying? That's why, oh God, please, uh, uh, I'm done now. I got to be done because I say this, y'all going. That's why a lot of you single people, you want a mystery person with money. You want a knight in shining armor. You don't want a man with dust on his clothes. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk to myself. You better say something to me. Yeah, Lord. Yeah, Lord. I feel like I should, I should, I should tune now. You want a man on a pony ride? You want genuine? <laughs> Joe got Roscoe. <laughs> Woo! You too, brothers. I want all this fine stuff. All this stuff. BBLs. BFLs. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm They blowing up. One side up, the other side down. Y'all know I'm going to tell the truth. Looking all weird. Looking weird. It look weird, too. Little legs. Little legs. Little. I mean, little like mine. And a monitor on the back. We know that's not real. I don't care what you put in that. Don't look right. You just look right. That's what the devil do to the church. Y'all didn't laugh. We had enough falling out. That's what the devil do to the church. That's what he does to us ministers. Think this is get a mega church with little legs. At some point, when you get older, what was added will flop. And when it flops, you in trouble. It's going to flop. It's going to be over. Superpowers deactivated. You know, y'all, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Look at some of the stars. Look, they got their face done. Why are your lips so puffy? Look like bees just landed on your mouth. Like 20 bees just. They all look like the Joker after a while. Just. And pull that face back. You can see all the bones. You... <laughs> right. It don't even look right. It's distorted. 
Uh, y'all can play. I'm done. It's a distorted look. I don't ever want this church to look distorted. Don't be blown up in one thing and poor in another. Don't be rich in spiritual gifts and nasty. I'm a preacher from the pulpit. Y'all all hear me. Hear me. The church has to model the leader. I welcome everybody. Don't be, don't, and after church, nobody can say hello to you. Get on out. I'm going to kick you out myself. I don't play that mess. I don't do that. Uncle is what they're going to mess. Some of the nastiest people you want to meet is in the holiness church. I done played every church. Oh, I'm with, I'm with pastor. Sit down. I'm with pastor. Sit down. I'm the organist. I got to go play. Just wait, let me ask. You got to ask. I've been through all of that. You know how many churches I've been to? I can't even count them. I'm 52 years old. You know how many churches I've been to since I was four years old? Carrying the pastors. This is the pastor's bags. I walked in. You going to make me wait? You going to ask him? Come on. We don't have, you know, and that's okay because it, it goes two ways. It goes two ways. You can't get nasty because they were nasty. Oh, oh. Can't get nasty because they were nasty. You can't repay evil for evil. That makes you evil. So let me stop some of y'all drivers. Flipping you the bird and what you do. Flip it right back. That's right. Call his name. Won't be the same. Can't get to Paul if you can't get, get, get rid of Saul. This is, this is, we're talking about Paul first. I can't even give you some of the deep knowledge of Paul unless you understand he had to get rid of Saul. This is the time where you get rid of Saul. You pour Saul on the carpet and you leave him here. Amen. Some of you here, that's why you're so reserved. Mm, 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 mm. You belong on the floor. I belong on the floor. I don't mind falling and getting up. I was in this church. My pants fell down while I was praising God. Literally. Pants fell off. Milton Van was here. He ripped his pants into shreds. And we tied a thing around his waist and he kept on dancing. Kenny was here. We all kinds of stuff happened right here. There is no pride in, 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 in this house. Get rid of all that. God can use people in this last day if you're going to retain your pride. That's why Paul had to go through. The Bible said he suffered many things. And I always wondered why. It's because he retained a pride based on knowledge. And he said it. On the on the on the the multiplicity of my revelation, I could get lifted up. So something was applied to my flesh, not my spirit. Something was given to me. It was there was an application of thorn. Thorn, and when I re, when you really understand thorns, you understand a fish hook. Because a fish hook goes in and it has a barb that you can't pull it back out. I'm a fisherman. I've been hooked many times. You know, brother, you be on a boat and the hook goes through your hand. You can't pull it back the same way it went in. You can't. You can't pull. Pastor Randy knows we've been hooked with hooks fishing. So when the thorn went in his flesh, God made sure there was a hook and a barb that he couldn't pull it out. So his powerful prayer couldn't pull out the thorn. It had to remain. It remained until he died. It didn't go nowhere because he was lifted up in revelation. Meaning God gave him revelation and gave him thorn. A messenger of Satan came to buffet me. The reason why the messenger was successful because he was anointed. <laughs> he was assigned to give him a thorn. Your, some of our assignments, this, in this season, some assignments are from God that he keeps. And the only release you get is when you come in this room. I'm going to stop. You only get your release here. You won't get it in another church. Every other place, you'll be functioning and sometimes performing. 
because something is in you and you got to go to a place of understanding who understands thorns who understands thorns and fish hooks are fishermen so if I want to get a hook out I would rather go to a fisherman than a doctor because <laughs> fishermen know how to take a knot tie it around the hook and pull it out of your finger and you don't even know it came out so many tricks to it doctors don't know it they'll cut you to get it out You're in a place that no knows. You're in a place that knows how to help your spirit. Amen. It's not fair, but we know how to help your spirit, man. Amen. I put my hand in that place where where it's contaminated. Go in there and let the Lord work to assign you to go some, to what you what your next move must be. It must be. Father, I thank you. I can't just slip your hands up and thank him that's all